If you're interested in learning sorting algorithms, bubble sort's a good place to start. Not because it's actually useful in practice, but because if you're trying to learn something, it's a good idea to start with something simple and then work your way up. What I'm going to do is write the code for bubble sort, starting simple and then adding optimizations. I'm going to use a visualization to show what happens in different cases, like if the input's already sorted, almost sorted or reversed and talk through how and why it works. We're starting with result, which is a shuffled array of numbers. And we're gonna go through adjacent pairs of numbers in result. And if the one on the left is greater than the one on the right, Swap them. So the first two is a five and a four. And the five is greater than the four, so we need to swap them. So it's now four, five, and they're then the right order. And you go on to the next pair, which is a five and a seven. And they're already in the right order, so you leave them alone and move on to the next pair which is seven and one. And seven's bigger than one, so we're gonna swap them and then move on to the next pair, seven and six. And seven's bigger than six, so we're gonna swap them. The next pair is seven and eight, and they're already in the right order. So we're gonna go on to the next pair, eight and three, and they're in the wrong order, so we're gonna swap them and move on to the next pair, eight and two, which are in the wrong order, so we're gonna swap them. That's just the first pass. Notice the largest number, the eight, has bubbled up to the top of the array. To sort the list, you need to do a pass for every element in the array. That's the simplest form of bubble sort. What it does is each pass brings the next largest element up into position. So now we've got the seven and the eight in position. The next pass will bring the six up into position. And the next pass will bring the five up into position. And then the four, the three, so it's just like selection sort in that each pass brings the next largest element into position. You might also notice as I'm going through here, after it's put the element into position, it's continuing to go through the rest of the pass and check through the already sorted elements. Now that is not necessary. So the first optimization I'm going to do is I want to make each pass one element shorter so that it's not repeatedly going over the bits that are already sorted. So now, after it's moved something into position, it doesn't need to go over it again. We've seen that each pass moves the next largest element up to the top. The question then is, how. So what happens is on each iteration we have a number on the left and a number on the right that we're looking at. In this case the five and the four. Either the largest number is on the left or it's on the right. In this case on the left. If it's on the left we swap so that it's on the right. If it was already on the right then we would leave it on the right. After an iteration the largest number ends up on the right. The next thing we do is when we move to the next iteration, what was the number on the right becomes the number on the left. So the five, which was the largest number out of the four and the five, when we then move to look at the next two, the five and the seven, it's on the left. So then we do the same thing, we compare them and we make sure the largest one of those two is on the right. In this case, it already is. And then 
when we move to the next iteration, the number on the left isn't just the largest number from the last iteration. It's actually the largest number we've seen so far. So on each iteration, we're comparing the number on the left, which is the largest element we've seen so far, with the next element, and making sure that the largest of those two ends up on the right. That maintains that the largest element seen so far will end up on the right. And if you keep doing that all the way through, when you get to the end, the largest element seen so far ends up all the way on the right at the end of the pass. Let's take a look at what happens if the array is already sorted. Hmm. That's gonna take a while. The problem here is that even though it's already sorted, it's still gonna go through every pass just to be sure. It'd be much better if it would somehow figure out, preferably after only one pass, that it's already sorted. The trick is, if you can get through an entire pass without having to swap anything, then you know that it's already sorted. One way to look at it is I'm embedding the algorithm for testing if a list is sorted, which I describe in another video, into the bubble sort. Now I'm going to look at what happens if the array is almost sorted. It's still doing a lot of going over things that are already sorted. If I scroll through time, but staying on the swap instruction, I can look at where swaps are actually happening. And there are these long jumps where it's, there's a run of things that are in order and don't need to be swapped. So what I want to do is I'm going to highlight those in blue to make that clearer. See, so when we're going through, sometimes we're swapping a lot and then we get to a run and then the blue line just sort of sticks at the last thing where it's swapped. See, it's going through a run, then it has to swap there. So that leaves the blue line there. So for almost sort of data, we get these long runs and then not so many swaps. Now what I want to do is for a situation like this, if the last swap was here before we got to the end, then there's this long run right at the end. And what I want to do is I want to join this run up with the run of green things here that we know are already sorted. Essentially, we can skip over a bunch of passes because if the last swap was here, we know that everything above that is already sorted. To write the code for that, instead of counting the passes upwards, I'm instead going to count the number of passes left and count downwards. So I have a variable called passes left that starts at the end.
and I don't need to track this anymore. So now we're, when we get to these situations where there's a big chunk, like this was the last swap, and then we get, when we get up to the top here, we can mark that all as sorted. And again here, that's all sorted. And then here again. Get to here. And everything since the last swap is sorted. We can just skip over those passes. By the way, if you like my explanation of bubble sort, there's a button for that. I said that bubble sort works like selection sort in that it moves the largest element into place on each pass. But now it can skip over passes. It's worth looking at what happens to the other elements because that can mean that we get to the sorted state sooner in fewer passes than selection sort would. Now to do that, I'm going to look at a shuffled list and rather than stepping through every step, I'm just going to step through where each step is a whole pass. So you can kind of watch the visualization step by step where each step is a whole pass. What happens is the larger elements move as far as they can to the right until they meet something larger and the small elements they moved to the left one step per pass. So you can sort of see each pass, most things move one step to the left because they're, they weren't ever the largest element seen so far. If you had a case where the smallest element was all the way on the right of the array, you would have to do all of the passes because the small element can only move one step to the left on each pass. So for example, that's what happens in the reverse order case. You have to go through every pass, making it a worst case for bubble sort. Since the speed of bubble sort is limited by how fast the small elements move, there are other algorithms which take bubble sort and modify it in ways to get the small elements to move faster. If you want to know more about that, I recommend watching my videos on cocktail sort and comb sort. There's also a playlist of sorting algorithm videos if you want me to show you more.